Hello, everyone. I think, uh, I think the sound is on, so welcome. Thanks for coming. My name is Mark Seaman, and uh, if you're interested in knowing more about me, there's information there on blog at Plur.dk, and I'm on Twitter at Plur, so if you think that's interesting, um, you can follow me there as well. Um, so, uh, so this talk is, uh, is, um, is about do software development productivity, and um, I think that we all know, or we, we probably have this um, understanding that we're probably not as, as productive as we'd like to be, and even if we feel that we, you know, ourselves feel very productive, we often have this uh, feeling that our, at least our managers uh, don't think that we are as productive as we'd like to be. And I think in general we have a problem with um, with pro productivity and software development in the sense that we could probably do better than, than we usually do. Um, so, so this talk is about software development productivity. And I'm not claiming that I have the one and only reason and the one and only uh, solution to the problem of software development uh, productivity. There's probably, it's probably a multifaceted, you know, hard problem to solve. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about here today is, I believe, at, at least a major component. I think if you can, um, you know, start to address the problem that I'm going to talk about here, you can probably, you know, that's my um, impression anyway, uh, you can really do something about your uh, productivity. But it's not going to be easy, it's going to be hard, um, so I'm not, I'm not offering any sort of uh, quick fixes here. Um, the problem that I think is quite fundamental to a lot of the things that we, um, that a lot of the problems that we experience is that we, we waste a lot of time reading existing code. So lots of different people have had you know, opinions on that. Robert C. Martin, in one of the books uh, he uh, has published, writes, the ratio of, of time spent reading versus writing is well over 10 to 1. And uh, other authors seem to agree with the general notion. Their estimates at the ratio you know, might vary a little bit from, uh, you know, um, from, from source to source, uh, but that's, uh, you know, the notion is that we spend a lot of time reading existing code. Um, and, you know, the fact that we have to read code at all is probably inescapable, uh, so it's not that I say that's, there's not, nothing wrong with reading existing code, it's just that you may spend too much time reading existing code and that's going to slow you down. And let me try to explain why that is. So we can take that ratio if we, um, you know, just take that for the sake of argument, the 10 to 1 ratio there, and we can plot it out and, and try to illustrate that with a, a figure like this one. So the, um, so the orange, uh, yellow uh, boxes there are, uh, you know, represent all the time that we spend reading existing code, and then the green uh, box there, you know, represents the time that we spend uh, writing new code. So that's 10 to 1. Um, usually when you hear people talk about software development productivity, you'll often here, you know, productivity discussed in terms of producing new code. So you will have, uh, you know, software vendors uh, who are who want you to have, you know, use their new, you know, development environment. Or you will have library authors that, you know, want you to use their new uh, libraries of frameworks. Or language designers that think their li language is better than the one that you're using up until now. Or the new version is better than the old version of the language. That happens a lot too. Uh, so that's often this sort of the, the framing of, of discussions of, of uh, productivity. But if we look at that in isolation, we could imagine just for the sake of argument that we can actually cut down the time that we have to spend writing new code by 50%. Now, that's not realistic at all, but just for the sake of argument, you can say, well, okay, so, so a 50% reduction of the time that we have to spend writing new code, that sounds like a huge productivity improvement. Uh, but really, it's not like in the overall picture, it's more like 4.5%. Now, and don't get me wrong here. I'm, I don't have anything. I don't have problems with productivity improvements in the in the writing, you know, part. You know, when when there's a new version of uh, you know various different editors out, I install the new version as well, and I take advantage of the new features for you know being a little bit more you know productive in terms of writing code because. There are other benefits of having those, you know, small improvements. They sometimes they make you happier because you, you know, you feel more productive, and that's that's a nice thing as well. But you know, when you really get down to it, you, you, even though you might feel more productive if you can use a new feature in a in, in a development environment, 
it's probably not really going to matter much uh, in the great scheme of things. If you don't do something about the readability part of it, uh, you know, e even, you know, even a 50% reduction in the time here wouldn't really amount to much more than 4.5. And the reality is that, that the productivity, you know, improvements that you get from new versions of a language or new IDE features and so on are probably much more marginal than that. So if you really want to tackle your productivity uh, issues, if, you know, imagine that you have any of those, uh, it would be a good idea to start thinking about what do we do about the read readability things. If we can cut down on that, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a much better opportunity to actually do something dramatic about our productivity. So at, you know, attack the, the orange boxes there and not the green one. So, um, so we want to make code readable, but we, we then need to figure out, okay, so how do we determine whether or not code is readable? So something like this, for example, is that readable or not? And um, you, know, you can have all sorts of subjective judge, you know, you know, opinions uh, about whether or not this is readable. So if you're a C-sharp developer, you'll probably recognize this as being fairly idiomatic C-sharp. I haven't done anything too fancy here. Uh, if you're not a C-sharp developer, if you do Java or TypeScript or you know, things from you know, that kind of you know, the C language, you can probably still you know, understand what's going on here. Um, but the point is not so much uh, to talk about this particular uh, piece of code. I will talk a lot about that piece of code and other pieces of code, but not because I actually want to talk about what it does. What I want to talk about is how we actually read code. Um, so I think in order to, to answer the question, is this readable, yes or no, or maybe a little bit of a fussy yes or no, so yes, maybe, no, um, we, we, need to be, um, we need to have a way to be a little bit of, you know, more objective about this sort of question that we usually tend to be. So often when you have discussions about readability, you will have a person in one corner of the room saying, I think this is readable, and then you'll have a person on the other uh, corner of the room says, this is absolutely unreadable, I hate it. And then the first person will come back and say, well, but it is, and the other one will say, but it's not. And you have this sort of kindergarten level kind of discussion going, which re doesn't really lead you anywhere. Um, so it's important to be able to, to talk about these things uh, in, a, in a way that is a little bit um, you know, uh, dispassionate, if you will. So if we can make it a little bit more objective, that, that would be good. So let's try to understand what actually happens when we read code. So usually, uh, you know, researchers have uh, you know, so far figured out is that we engage in a, in a process called cognitive compilation, uh, where basically what we're trying to do when we're presented with a piece of code like this that we haven't seen before is that we start to engage in this process where we are sort of like trying to parse and interpret the code and almost run a little emulator in our brain and trying to imagine what's actually going to happen. So if you do that, you'll probably see that you know, one of the first things that happen in this uh, you know, piece of source code is that we create an object called allocation. And if you know C-sharp, you know list of table or list of T in general is a collection and it's, uh, it may change state. You can add things to it, you can remove stuff from it, you can reorder it, and you can do all sorts of things uh, with a collection like that. And depending on what you do, that might then impact you know, the run, you know, the, you know, the execution of what, what happens next. So it's probably important to keep track of the state of an object like that. So you sort of, you know, make a little mental model for, you know, in your own brain and saying, okay, so, so I have this allocation here, which is a collection of tables, uh, and that might be important, so I'm going to keep track of the state of that and say, okay, what's, what do I believe is contained within this object? What the state of, what's the state of this object? And then you go on and, and, and you interpret more of the code. So there's a for each uh, loop there, and you, you know that you know, if, if what you're for eating over is empty, you're just going to fall all the way through. So in that case, nothing's going to happen to that allocation object. On the other hand, if you have at least one thing, then you're going to do something else. Um, so here we are searching for a particular table, and um, if, we, if we find it, we do something. If we don't find it, we do something else. So this little table is curly brackets. That's a, a C-sharp pun, basically, meaning if table is something, and that is uh, as opposed to null. So basically what it says there is, is if table is not null, we'll do one thing, otherwise we'll do another one. So if, if table is null, we're just going to fall through again. If table is not null, if it's something, we're going to do uh, you know, something with that allocation. So what we do here, you'll notice, is we remove the table and then we sort of add another table back in. Um, so there's still only one object that we're keeping track of in our memory, um, so, um, so, um, so that's probably not, not too hard to follow. So again, I'm not 
talking you through this in order to talk you through this particular algorithm. I'm talking you through this in order to, to try to outline what happens in the brain uh, when uh, programmers typically tr you know, read code that they haven't seen before. And um, this, you know, the, the code in the yellow box there, you can see we remove something from the collection, then we add another thing to the collection. People always get a little bit confused about that because they say, well, table.reserve uh, will change the state of the table. It doesn't. It returns a new table that is now reserved, and that's what we add back. So that's why that's a little bit odd. Uh, but people always get confused about that, so I just thought that I'd call it out. So basically, um, we have a few, um, a few ways to talk about the complexity of this code. And uh, we can say, well, so the, the, um, the number of objects that we keep, have to keep track of, of state of is one. There's, a, there's basically only one object where we really change state. And what happens there is fairly trivial, so it's not too hard. So it's only one, one thing that actually changes state. Uh, that seems like something that we can do. That's not difficult to understand, so that's probably readable. And there are three different you know, alternative pathways through the system. Um, denoted or depicted by those three um, arrows there. And this is a measurement known as cyclomatic complexity, which you may have heard about before, but it's basically just that, you know, the notion that we are, we are trying to figure out what are the alternative pathways through the system. So what that tells us is also that it tells us a little bit about the cognitive load uh, of reading a, a piece of code like this one, because we somehow need to um, keep in our brain the notion that it might, you know, the, the, this code might behave in one of three different ways. So it's almost like a little superposition of states where you have three different, you know, pathways through the code. But we, in order to understand this method, we sort of have to, have to understand how all of those three pathways work. So that might tax our brain a little bit. Um, but I would say this is readable because the numbers, you know, three in cyclomatic complexity and the number, you know, one, one uh, object that may change state, that um, that's probably okay. So why do I see, say that that is probably okay? Do I have some sort of threshold where I say, okay, so is three, if cyclomatic complexity of three is, uh, is fine, you know, what about cyclomatic complexity of five, is that still okay? Seven, is that still okay? 10, is that still okay? 50, is that still okay? So there must be some sort of threshold where we say, okay, um, you know, around that threshold, it's probably gonna be difficult to follow. So there's this notion, there's a, and, and a result from experiments, experimental psychology uh, from 1956 by a researcher called George A. Miller, an experimental psychologist, who came up with this, um, he, he published this paper, you probably heard the title of it, it's called The Magical Number 7 Plus Minus 2. And basically what he found back then was that uh, we, in short-term memory, we can keep track of about seven things, you know, give and take. Uh, so um, so that's, that's pretty much all we have to deal with in our short-term memory. And this result, it's from 1956, it's actually quite robust. It's been, you know, other researchers have uh, attempted to reproduce that experiment later on, and they tend to uh, arrive at, you know, basically maybe even an even smaller threshold, uh, but, n but the order of magnitude is, is, is about right. So I'm just gonna stick with the magical number seven because seven is a magical number. So well, let's just assume for the sake of argument that that's as, as much stuff we can keep track of in our short-term memory. We can just keep track of seven things in short-term memory. So, um, so George A. Miller you know, asked his, uh, you know, um, the people who partook in the experiment, he asked them to keep track of lots of different things, you know, remembering random numbers and so on. Uh, he also sometimes asked them to remember other things that were more like clusters of information. So instead of just being you know, primitive things like numbers, they might be clusters of information, and he called those chunks. Um, so in general, we need to realize that the stuff that we need to keep track of when we're reading code is, is not you know, primitive things like numbers, but more like chunks of inf information, like objects and how objects uh, you know, interact with each other. And, um, and we, we do have a little bit of a problem, though, because you know, in, in a real code base, we have a lot of stuff going on. So you might, if you start a, you know, an entirely greenfield uh, code base, you might start with Hello World, and Hello World is literally just one thing going on. There's not a lot of stuff uh, happening there. But as you, you know, start to add more things to the code base, you tend to you know, keep on adding things and adding things and adding things. So they pile up. So a, you know, a realistic code base is not gonna have you know, at most seven things going on. That, you know, that would fit in short-term memory. 
But what a real code base is probably going to have is it's going to have, have you know, 7,000 7, things going on, or 7 million things going on. So there's going to be a lot of things going on. And, um, and that's not going to fit in our short-term memory. So, um, so we, we have a couple of options here. You know, um, I'll get back to how we can work with short-term memory in a little while, because I think it's, it's really beneficial if we can. Um, but the other option that we have is that we can start to rely more on long-term memory. So long-term memory in the brain is a completely different thing. Um, we may not even understand how vast it is, if there's any sort of limit to it. Um, various different you know, brain researchers seem to have different notions of you know, exactly how long-term memory uh, works. Some people say that we actually never forget anything, but we, it's just that we lose the ability to locate those memories. I don't know, but at least you know, long-term memory is a completely different uh, kind of thing. The problem with long-term memory, though, is that um, it's slow. So um, it takes time to actually learn things and uh, commit them to long-term memory. If you ever done a you know a study, you know, university, you know, education or something similar, you know that you have to you know study and repeat the same things over and over again uh, until they actually stick. So it takes time to make things stick in in long-term memory. Um, so this seems to me to be the strategy that most organizations sort of default to when we talk about the code base. A couple of years ago, I was uh, visiting a, a client of mine who wanted me to help them with um, you know, improving their legacy uh, code base. Uh, and they showed me some of the code, and it was just like you know, all, all the other legacy code bases that I've seen in, in terms of being way too complex. And uh, I had the opportunity to talk to some of the developers who were working on that code base. And uh, one of them was the most recent hire. He did, he'd been there in two, uh, two years. And uh, so I thought, OK, so he, he could probably still remember what it was to start in this code base. So I asked him, so when you came, uh, when you started this job uh, two years ago, how long would you say that it took you until you were actually able to work on your own, you know, on your own hand in this code base? And he didn't miss a beat. He just said, three months. You know, that was absolutely clear to him. It took him three months to actually be able to work in that code base on his own. And I think the reason for that is that he, during those three months, he was working, you know, diligently um, to figure out, you know, how do, who, how do I commit the, the structure of this, you know, um, this uh, legacy code base, how do I commit that structure to long-term memory? And once he sort of had that figured out, he could start to work with the code base because now he actually understood it. So it's not that we can't work uh, with code bases if there's more than seven things going on. It's just that we have to rely on a different memory access strategy. And that you know, me memory strategy, and I'm talking about human memory here, I'm not talking about computer memory, that memory strategy is quite slow. It's, it seems to be orders of magnitude slower than you know, utilizing short-term memory. Now, while I've been talking, you'll notice that this little animation here just keeps on adding um, more and more uh, chunks of information, and they sort of start to press against each other and uh, also form this you know, more or less regular-looking uh, grid. So another option of, you know, so one option is to rely on long-term memory and basically try to keep everything in memory, in long-term memory, and then hope the structure of the code base doesn't change too radically because then, you know, that knowledge would become obsolete. So that's, that's one option to say, okay, we just have to rely on, on long-term memory, and, but that's, you know, the reason why we often spend a lot of time reading code because it's hard. Now, another option that we might have is to say, well, okay, what if we could, you know, pick out at most seven of those things, uh, you know, and take them out of the entire context and look at them in isolation? If we can isolate seven of those, uh, at most seven of those things, enough from the surrounding context, there shouldn't be more going on that we can actually, you know, deal with that or think about that in terms of short-term memory. So, uh, so we could, you'd imagine that we, that we pick out, you know, just uh, at most seven of those things. Uh, and if we do that, we'll arrive at something that might look a little bit more like this. Um, so I call this figure a hex flower because it looks a little bit like a flower. Um, it's made up of hexagons, so that's, that's the reason for the name. So this is a, you know, you can, you can think about this as a symbol of, you know, your short-term memory or you know, almost like a logo of your, uh, for your short-term memory in the sense that this depicts the, 
the capacity of your short-term memory sort of in context, you know, you know implied that it's, it exists in a context with a lot of other stuff, but now we're just isolating seven things, and, and if, we can, if we can do that, if we can isolate at most seven things and look at those in isolation, we might be able to understand that you know, using our short-term memory instead of our long-term memory. So if we can do that, it means when we look at some code, if we can organize code in such a way that this works, it means that you know, when, when, whenever we lo look at a piece of code, it's isolated enough that uh, it makes sense uh, in isolation. And one of the keys to doing this is abstraction. So each of those seven things that might interact, there might be seven objects that are interacting, uh, something like that. That, you know, each of those objects will probably be at a level of abstraction where if you want to know how that particularly works, you, you can still zoom in on that, and, you know, that should reveal a new layer of complexity. And in that new layer of complexity, we still want to respect the, the cognitive boundaries. You know, the brain, uh, the wetware that we are, um, you know, equipped with has this boundary of about seven things, or this threshold of about seven. So if we don't respect that, we can't you know, rely on our short-term memory, and then we have to rely on long-term memory instead. So if we keep on zooming in on layers of abstraction, we might say, OK, so, so here's an example of what that might look like in code. So, um, so all the code that I'm showing you here is from my book, The Code That Fits In Your Head. I have a couple of copies uh, sitting down here. I'm going to give them away at the end of the talk. Um, so stick around for that if you're interested. Um, but um, what we'll be looking at here is a create method that sits on a class uh, whose responsibility it is to, you know, talk to a SQL Server database. And it's, you know, whether or not a SQL Server is not really important. What we want to know here is whether this code is readable. In other words, does it fit in your head? Does it fit in your short-term memory? Uh, so if we try to do a little bit of a um, of quantification here, we, we try to say, well, what's some objective measurements of, you know, how much stuff is going on? We could we could try to, you know, look at cyclomatic complexity, and we can we can see that there's only two pathways through the code because, uh, you know, one pathway is, is that reservation is null, and then we throw in an, an, an argument null, null exception there, and then nothing else happens, or we just go all the way through the code and do whatever it is that the um, the code says in a linear fashion. So there's only those two options. So, um, so if the threshold is seven and we only have two alternative pathways, that's probably okay. What about counting, you know, interacting objects? Well, at the beginning, we just try to start to enumerate the objects and say, you know, how many objects do we actually have interacting here? So we have a restaurant ID, that's one, a reservation, that's two. We have a connection string, which you might wonder where, where that comes from, but that's a read-only property on the class. It's just a string, and if you're not a C-sharp developer, a property is just a glorified class uh, field. Uh, it's a getter method. So a connection string, we can use that to create something called a SQL connection. That's, a con that's another object. Um, we use the con, the con object and then together with another string, create reservation SQL. So again, you can't see where that comes from, but this, this is not even a property. This is just a hard-coded string that that's just, you know, uh, holds the actual SQL, you know, the T-SQL you know, query that I'm going to execute against the database. It's not a query when you, cr you have a create, I think, but anyways. Um, it's just a hard-coded string uh, with placeholders. And then we use that to create a sixth object, um, and that's it. You know, there are no further objects involved here, because once we've done creating those objects, we basically just go ahead and modify uh, some of those objects. And you'll notice that we actually only in, end up modifying two of them. So we, we do modify command six times, and we also modify you know, con towards the end, because we open the connection, and that actually changes the state of the object. The rest of the objects are actually not involved in state changes, uh, but uh, you might have to... Um, it's, well, I, I, let's put it some, some, uh, in another way. It's fairly obvious that, you know, if you have an input argument that's an integer, you know, the one labeled one, that's not going to change state because, you know, input arguments that are integers are in, immutable, and it's not by, by reference, it's not being passed by reference, so you can't change it, so it seems fairly obvious. Um, and these strings are all read-only as well, so they're not going to change state either. It turns out the reservation is actually also an immutable object, what we call a value object, so, um, so that's not going to change state either. So there's really only two things that you know, end up changing state. Um, but even if we want to be a little bit more coarse-grained and just you know, blindly count all the, the objects that are involved in this particular little piece of code, it's, um, there's only six things going on. 
And if you have a, a limit on your short-term memory that, where you can keep track of at least seven things, this should be good. So at, at least according to two, two alternative ways of, two, of quantifying things, you know, cyclomatic complexity and object activation count, this, uh, I, would, I would claim, is readable because it fits in your head. So what we can do is we can, you know, one way to illustrate that is we can enumerate all the things that are happening or we can try to assign them each to that, you know, hex flower here. And again, the, I'm not suggesting that you actually have a little, you know, stack of paper with all of those hex flowers lying beside you and you sort of actually do this, you know, type, you know putting them in like that. Although I think this might actually be a good business model for me uh, to sell those papers, but, it, but anyways. Um, no, the, the point is I'm just trying to sort of create a visual illustration of, you know, what I'm aiming at here. So, uh, so the notion is that, the, or the general idea is that we should think about this hex flower as, as again, a visual representation of your short-term memory. Now, the, um, the create method that I just showed you here was interesting because it was at the lowest level of abstraction in the sense that um, it didn't really call any of my other code. You know, you have a code base with a lot of stuff going on, and often you will write code that calls uh, some other code that you also wrote that calls some other code that you also wrote. Um, but uh, that's, that's not really what was happening here. The most of the code that we were just looking at, let's see if we can go back. Um, yeah, my animations sort of only go one way. We can't go back. Oh, let's go back. There's, what, there's, a way to, there's always a way to go back. Let's, let's have a look at it again. All right, so, so the point that I was trying to make here is that most of the code that we are interacting with here is, uh, is, is, is framework code. It's not something that we wrote. So this is sort of like the lowest level of abstraction in terms of user code, uh, because SQL connection and SQL command uh, is not a class that I have written. That's just part of the .NET framework. Okay, so that's... Okay, let's see if we can go move forward again here. So that's, that's just the point that I was trying to make. Uh, but you might then say, all right, so but that create method that we just looked at here, um, you know, some of our code is going to call that, and if that, you know, um, if we already have six things going on inside of the create method in terms of object activation, then if we have some other code that calls that, and it probably does some other things as well, doesn't it mean that, well, maybe we can, you know, keep things at seven things or fewer at the lowest level of abstraction, but what about higher levels of abstraction? Isn't it going to compound, you know, add up so that the rest of the code is not going to fit in our head? What do we do about that? So, so the point is that the, our short-term memory is as it is, uh, and we can't really do anything about that. So we should be able to, you know, not only zoom in, but we should also be able to zoom out and say, at a higher level, the code should be organized in such a way that it respects the cognitive constraints of our, you know, short-term memory. Because if that's not true, it's not going to fit in our short-term memory. And then again, we have to rely on long-term memory, and that means we're going to spend a lot of time reading or trying to understand the code. So if we zoom all the way out, we should actually be able to end up at the entry point of the application and say, does that fit in my head? You know, at a high level of abstraction, does that fit in my head? And, uh, and this, is, uh, this, this is the entry point of the application. I didn't write it. It's just a, there's a wizard that, you know, if you start a new ASP.NET project, you just go through, and that's what it does. And if you've ever seen any of, th of these before, you know that all the, all the interesting things happen in the class called Startup. Now, I'm not assuming that you know ASP.NET. It's not the point here. Uh, but I'm just trying to say, well, even at the highest level of abstraction, does it fit in my head? And you can see there's not a lot of stuff going on here. There's no cyclomatic complexity to speak of, and there's only really three things uh, going on. All the, all the interesting stuff happens here in startup. So, um, so if I want to learn about you know, what, what's the structure of startup, what does startup look like, I should be able to go and, and you know, change my perspective you know, change the scope of analysis, uh, if you will, and go just look at startup. And when I do that, you know, Web Builder and Arcs should no longer be relevant for my understanding. So let's try to do that, and we can just zoom in a little bit and say, okay, if we look at startup, do we need to understand Web Builder and Arcs in order to understand the structure of this class? And uh, I, would, I would claim that's not really the case. It, these things are now out of scope, if you will, in terms of our understanding. We don't need to understand how those work. So again, if we try to, to quantify here, do we have a lot of stuff going on? No, we don't really. You know, uh, again, if you ha have done any ASP.NET uh, development, you know that all the interesting things happen inside those two methods, configure and configure services. And then we have this um, constructor here that, you know, that, that uh, populates the, the, uh, the property there. So they sort of go together. So there's only like three things going on there. So, 
Again, that, you know, at, at that level of abstraction, the code fits in your head, and more so even easily. So what happens inside of configure services, this is probably the one that you want to, to look at, um, is that organized in such a way that it, it fits your short-term memory? Let's go ahead and have a look at that one. So you'll notice that, well, um, you know, the, the, you'd probably not be surprised to learn that this is also organized so that it fits in your head. But you'll notice that it doesn't fit on the screen, uh, at least not, it doesn't fit on a, on a PowerPoint slide. So there's a little bit more going on, you know, towards the, uh, you know, below the screen there, but we're going to scroll up here. That's not, it's not very interesting, actually. There's no surprises there. Um, but again, instead of just having this uh, subjective discussion on whether or not this is readable, let's try to ask ourselves, does it fit in short-term memory? And we can try a couple of different quantification mechanisms to answer that question. So we can say, what's the cyclomatic complexity? Do we have any alternative pathways through this code? And it turns out that we don't. It's just, it just runs straight through. So cyclomatic complexity is one because there's only one pathway through the code. Uh, so that's as low as it gets. Uh, so on that measurement, it's, it's, um, it couldn't be simpler. What about object activation? We can try to count all the objects that are involved. Most of those objects here are actually not you know, immutable integers or string. They're actually objects that may change state. So this one may tax our brain a little bit more than the create method that I showed you before. But still, there's only six things going on. And you might say, but you know, below the screen, there might be more. But they're not. it turns out that they're, they're not. So, um, so again, we can say, well, six is less than seven, so um, according to that quantification mechanism, we should feel fairly confident that this code is readable. The point that I'm trying to make in terms of you know, fitting code into your short-term memory is that we, if you can work mostly with your short-term memory, you should be able to encounter code you've never seen before and spend only a couple of minutes, so you, you don't have to spend hours in order to understand what's going on. Um, and maybe you can't do it just you know, while I'm talking here, but if you sit with this just by yourself, you should be able to understand the structure of this code in, in an, a matter of a couple of minutes. And I'm not talking about all the details that happen behind the scenes. So if we scroll down, for example, you can see there's a sort of a list of things that happen in a lot of, of you know, um, helper methods that are being called uh, that do you know, some more details uh, set up. And I've often encountered programmers who feel that they don't understand uh, you know, things until they've understood all the details. Uh, so if you're in that camp, you might say, yeah, but I don't know what happens inside of configure authorization. So that means as long as I don't understand what happens inside of that, I don't understand this code at this level of abstraction. And I, you know, the, basically what I'm trying to say here is let go of that notion let, you know, let, you know, details matter, and if you need to know something about you know, authorization, you go and look at that code. Uh, but to understand this, the overall structure of the code that we're looking at right now, that should be understandable. You should be, under, you should be able to understand how the code that we're looking at here sort of in, in plays together with each other. And then you can say, there is, again, the, the level of abstraction is super high here, so we are almost at the entry point of the application. So we are not learning any details about how the application works. This is more like, you know, this gives us a little bit of a, a, a preview of what's the architecture, what's the structure of this particular code base. And then you can say, okay, if I want to know about authorization, is it, you know, is there authorization? Is it username password? Is it JWT? You know, how, that's, how does that work? I can go and look at configure authorization, or, you know, as most people probably want, to do, they want to say, oh, I, I, want to need, I need to know how the, the data store works, and you can, you know, configure repository looks like a promising name, and then you can go and, and have a look at that. And the point is, when you do that, when, when you go and look at configure repository, you, you know, that code should also be structured in such a way that everything that is in scope there is all you need to know, and what actually happened at this level of abstraction should now be out of scope, because when you zoom in on the detail, the, the surrounding context should now become irrelevant. So, um, so that's another way to sort of enumerate things. This is a little bit of a cheat enumeration here, um, but basically the point that I'm trying to make still is that we should be able to, um, to work at various different levels of abstraction. Very high levels of abstraction where there's not a lot of detail, but you get you know, a high level view of, of how things work and how things play together. And then you can zoom in to very low levels of details, and uh, you then you can see how those actually work. But in, when understanding, when trying to understand the low-level details, you don't have to understand the, the high-level uh, structure of things.
All right, so, um, so one thing that I sort of left dangling there is that um, I said, well, so the create method that we started looking at, some of my code or some of the code in this code base is going to call that, and um, we might be worried that the, the, um, the complexity inside of a method like, comp like create method, even though it's, it's well and good enough within the our short-term uh, memory ourselves, but then if, when we try to combine it with other code that does other things but that may have a little bit of complexity itself, don't those things add up and then become difficult to understand? And that's what happens in, you know, in a normally structured code base where people haven't thought about this thing, um, but you can absolutely write code in such a way that that doesn't happen. Um, so, um, so here's an example of that. So in general, I'd say, what, what is the key to avoiding those kinds of details to leak out into the next level of abstraction? And the overall answer to that is encapsulation. That is the actual purpose of encapsulation, you know, object-oriented uh, en encapsulation. And most people think that encapsulation means information hiding, which I think is a, is a, a bit of a misunderstanding. Encapsulation means that you have a sufficient level of abstraction so that you can think about an object um, you know, um, as just one thing. Instead of, all, you know, instead of thinking about all the implementation details inside the object, you can think about an object as being one thing. Um, so, um, so I'm very much in the camp of you know, viewing encapsulations as they're described by Bertrand Meyer. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, you can... Uh, well, you can go and read object-oriented software construction uh, or, um, or, or other things. So there, there's def plenty of uh, literature about that. Um, but I would, I would claim there's, there's a little bit of a shortcut to, to encapsulation where instead of just uh, relying on uh, a fuzzy notion of, of uh, you know, contracts and pre- and post-conditions and invariants and so on, um, if you can, there's a shortcut to, to have things that have good encapsulation that's actually you know, more concrete, easier to measure, easier to be objective about, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. So I think um, if, we, if we just come back to this allocate method here, so we did establish that it has a cyclomatic complexity of three, and if we just want to be coarse-grained and count all the objects that are involved here, there's actually six objects, although we did establish before that only one of them really, really changed state. Um, but if we want to be a little bit uh, unsophisticated in our, our analysis here, we can say, well, there's six things going on. Uh, we can't have those six things, um, you know, escaping to the next level of abstraction. If, if, if I'm sitting at the next level of abstraction, I'm, the, I'm writing the code that calls this allocate method. If I have to understand the implementation details of what's going on inside of Allocate, I need to understand those six things, then the calling code is not going to fit in my head because then I, I need to add those six things to some other things that I'm doing out there in the calling code. So it's very important that these six things that, that, that are happening inside of the Allocate method, that they don't escape. They, they have to be stay within this scope. That's encapsulation. We can't allow that complexity to, to, to escape so that you have to understand that on the next level. And I would claim that this is uh, true of the allocate method as, as it's written here. And there's two reasons for that. Now, first of all, this method has no side effects. So what does a side effect mean? So a side effect is basically something that changes the observable state of the program, um, either you know, directly or transitively. So what do I mean by changing the state of the system? Well, if you send an email, you can observe that. If you, um, if you delete a row in a database, you can probably observe that because you know, something else you know, changes when you start to query or look at the database and the state of the database. If you write to disk, you change the state of the system. If you change pixels on the screen, you do something that has an observable side effect. Um, so there are lots of things where you have side effects, and side, side effects are basically the reasons why we are writing software. Um, but if you can avoid that, uh, that, that means that the code that you are looking at is a little bit easier to understand. So do I have any of these things uh, in the allocate method? Uh, do I send email here? No, it doesn't look like that. Am I writing to disk? No, it doesn't look like that. Am I querying a web service? No, not, not really. Am I you know, printing, you know, changing pixels on the screen? No, not really. Okay, so I have, I have no side effects here. Um, so there's another property of the code that we're looking at here, and that is it always returns the same uh, you know, output value for the same input. So again, we can, we can look at that and we can say, okay, so, um, so what would be ways where that is not true? 
you know, if, um, if I'm doing some sort of random number generation and I'm relying on a random number in order to, you know, go one way or another, that would mean that, you know, even if the input, the reservations, the reservations is the input and the, the tables property is also part of the input, you know, that, you know, that would, that might, you know, if I did any sort of random number generation and relied on a random number in order to do one on, on another thing, that might change the output, but that's not happening here. Uh, I'm also not relying on, you know, the current uh, date and time, so I'm not looking at, you know, is this a Sunday and then I'm doing something special if it's a Sunday, that's not the case here as well. Um, I'm not calling any sort of, you know, out of process web service or anything else like that. So there's nothing, uh, you know, external that can change the output. If the input is the same, the output is always going to be the same. So those two properties, uh, qualities, you know, combined, uh, produces this thing we call a pure function. So the allocate method is a pure function. And um, pure functions are interesting because they're referentially transparent. And I know that I'm using some, some, f some fancy words here. But basically, referential transparency means that the function call is equal to its result. Um, so if you already know what the result is, there's no reason to call the function because the, the only thing the function does is that it produces the result. Um, so, um, so those two things are, are equal to each other. Now, this is different from a normal you know, procedure where if you have a procedure that has a side effect, you, know, you might have something going on in, in where you write a little method that returns the number 42, uh, but before it does that, it, uh, you know, it writes something else to disk. And that means you can't just replace the method call with the output, the number 42, because you also care about this side effect happening. Now, this is not ca the case for referentially transparent functions. If you already have the result, the, the, how you arrive at the result is actually irrelevant. So this means you can take you know, something, you know, an algorithm of arbitrary complexity. Uh, it doesn't really matter how complex it is. You know, towards the end, it, it produces a result, and then the result is all you need to know about. This is what happens, for example, when you're using uh, cryptography uh, algorithms. So typically, if you want to do something with the cryptography, unless that's actually your specialty, you're probably relying on some sort of an object or an API that does that for you. And then you, know, you say, OK, please uh, take this array of bytes and encrypt it. And then you get another array of bytes back. And then you're good. And you don't care how you actually arrived at that you know, encrypted array of bytes. You just know that you did. So this, is, this would be an example of doing that. I know cryptography sometimes involves a little bit of randomness, but you can, you can factor that out so that you can you know, feed in a deterministic random number generator if, if you wanted to do that. So the reason why I think it's interesting that a function is equal to its result is that it means when we look at allocate from the outside, if we know that this is a pure function, which it is, it means it's how it arrives at that allocation that it returns is not really relevant for the caller. The only thing that the caller needs to understand is that allocate is an allocation. Okay, because you, you can notice on the last line of, of code, it returns an allocation. So we can think about this, even though it has some you know, complexity, as being just one thing. And the point is that all the complexity that's inside of this function here does not escape. The only thing that escapes is one thing, the allocation that it returns. So this means it fits in your head. It, you know, when we look at it from the next level of abstraction, it is just one thing. We can truly put it in just one cell in that hex flower, and that's OK, because all the complexity stays within the, the, the pure function. It doesn't leak through. All right, so, um, so to summarize, uh, we should be able to look at things at various different levels. We should be able to go and zoom in. Uh, at another level of abstraction, and then if we want to make the code readable, we should make sure that it's it's structured in such a way that it you know that it respects the human uh, limitations of the short-term memory, which is about you know seven things. Uh, so we should be able to do that you know if we zoom in on the you know a lower level of detail, and we should be able to do that if we zoom out and uh, look at the highest level of detail, which might be the entry point. And in all of those cases, we should keep on you know, structuring the code in such a way that there's at most seven things going on because that's what the brain wants us to do. So, um, so here's the, that animation once more, just because it looks good. Um, so, um, so we do understand that if we just pick some arbitrary level of abstraction and we look at some code and we say it's structured in that way, you know, when we look at it at that level of abstraction, that's fine, it's understandable. We also still know that even if we don't, you know, at this level of, of abstraction, we are not caring about the details. We know that the details are there. So within each of those, you know, seven 
you know, hexagons here, if we structure the code the same all the way through, there's going to be, you know, in each of those hexagons, there's going to be, you know, at most seven other hexagons uh, for a total of 49 hexagons here. Now, 49 does not fit in your brain. That's not the, the point is exactly that um, even though we acknowledge that this is the case, we're not thinking about more than one level of abstraction at a time because it gets even worse because each of those 49 hexagons, if we keep on doing this, will have you know, maybe seven others that will have you know, seven others and so on. So, um, so this, uh, this figure I call the fractal hex flower because uh, this is a fractal figure. Um, so um, if you're not convinced that this is a, a fractal, you say, oh, that's not a fractal. You were expecting something like the Mandelbrot set, something like that. I'll show you another fractal, which is definitely a fractal. This is known as the Cox snowflake, where we just you know, start subdividing straight lines into you know, putting a little tri triangle on it, if, um, if you notice what happened there. And, uh, and this is a, a well-known you know, fractal in uh, that you know, discipline of, of mathematics that you know, deals with those things. And you can keep on zooming in on the, uh, on the edge of the Cox snowflake, and we can just keep on rendering um, you know, smaller and smaller details if we want to. We have to stop rendering in terms of you know, screen uh, granularity here, but we, if we imagine that we zoom in, we can keep on zooming in forever. And that's the same thing we can do with this one. We can keep on adding new uh, levels of abstraction into this figure if we wanted to. I just stopped at, at four iterations because if I add a fifth layer here, it just becomes one green thing. It basically just looks... Uh, like a, a green blob. All right, so, um, so the point is that, you know, we, I think we can cut down on the, on, the, um, on the reading time of the existing code if we structure the code in such a way uh, that it fits uh, in our heads. So, and that's also the title of the book. I am, I am actually done with the talk here now, but I also left a little room for, um, you know, doing a little bit of a and a if you will. So, so I, was, uh, I was planning on, on giving away the two copies of the book that I have sitting down here. If no one stole them, yeah, no, they're still there. <laughs> um, so, um, so the first two people who are, you know, fortunate enough to, um, to ask a decent question uh, will get uh, the copies. Uh, but I'll be happy to answer more questions than two. And I'm, a, I'm afraid that because of the, um, of the lights up there, I, I'm really having trouble seeing. If you're raising your hands up there, maybe can we turn the lights down a little? bit if there's any, anyone here who's actually listening the, in the AV department over there. Hello. Is it possible to turn down the lights a little bit because I, I want to see the audience now. That's a little bit. Yeah, that, get, that gets better. I should have brought my sunglasses, right? All right. Uh, if you're sitting just below the, the, the lights there, you're, you're basically out of luck, <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid. Um, all right. But uh, let's see. Uh, does anyone have any, any questions? Uh, I don't just want to go with the people in the front row, but um, I, yeah, there's one up, up there that I can see. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I was curious, uh, when you count the, the number of pixels you get, um, when you consider psychromatic complexity, does that count as uh, a pixel in uh, this counting method? All right, so let's see if I understand what you, what you are asking about. You say, when I'm, when I'm counting things that are ha going on, uh, one of the things, one of the measurements that I use is cyclomatic complexity, but I also counted objects. And uh, are you asking whether I want, you know, if I have six objects and a cyclomatic complexity of two, are you asking or whether I, I want to add those two things together? It, it, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. think that was my question, but I think I understand it as well, that you, that you look at one metric at a time. Right? Yes, that's, that's the, okay, so you, you, you basically, you know, by asking a question, you, you figure out that you actually already understood the answer. I think that's a... That's actually something that I write about in the book as well, is that sometimes just asking a question might lead to insight. So I think that still leads to the insight that you might want to have. Can you pass it up, please? Um, <laughs> if, if, if that's possible. Oh, that's, thanks. You're, you're so friendly. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, but so basically it's just to reiterate. Um, the, um, the cyclomatic complexity is one measure uh, the object activation is another measure. One thing that I didn't talk about, which I actually think is a really easy measure to, to look out for, is just lines of code. Uh, so those are just three you know, in, uh, individually independent kinds of measurements where each of them are probably, it's probably a good idea to keep, keep all three in mind, but I'm not adding them together. They're just, what I really want to do with these kinds of measurements is to enable you to have a discussion about readability that is a little bit more objective um, than just the kindergarten argument where you know one person says 
I don't like it, and the other person says, but I like it, and then you go, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Um, so if you can start having the discussion where you say, yeah, but the cyclomatic complexity is this, or the object uh, activation count is this, or we have this you know, many number of lines of code, then uh, you can perhaps hopefully have a little bit of a more dispassionate uh, discussion about the code quality in, in the code that you are working with together. Uh, that's, that's more the point. That's, that's the, um, I'm basing this talk on, uh, this is just not, so, not something that I pulled out of thin air. It's actually based on, on practices that I just arrived at over you know, maybe 10 or 15 years where you know, I keep on running into this, having the same discussions with people where, where you know, developers will ask me, yeah, but Mark, why do you think it's time to refactor this particular code right now? And, uh, and then you know, slowly I've arrived at this, um, these notions well, where I say, well, I actually think that this is getting too complex because of you know, cyclomatic complexity or because of object activation. And that seems to generally be something that most people can accept. Uh, because it's not just my opinion, it's actually something that's, that's dis, you know, disconnected from subjectivity to a certain degree. I hope, um, that, I hope that was more than an you know, answer to the question. So let's see, does, do, do we have someone over here? Or, uh, yes, we have it. I'm sorry, uh, but we have uh, someone here as well. Uh-huh. All right, so, so, so let me see if I understand the question here. So you're saying, well, when, we are, when, we're, when we're starting to go deep into the code and, and try and start to look at the details, then what happens to all the other things that are sitting uh, maybe at the same level of abstraction, but, that, but it's not the detail that we're looking at right now? That's, that's your question. So, so you, you basically ask, uh, and then you said, do we then have to rely on long-term memory to, in order to understand you know, all the other things that might happen uh, while, um, while we're looking at a piece of, of, of detailed code. That's your question, right? Did I get that right? Okay, good. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make here is that, I, and I said this in a side remark, I said, well, a lot of code is organized in such a way that that's actually what you need to do, exactly what you said here. But what I want you to start thinking about is to say, even if you're at a very detailed level, there might be a lot of other code you know, at the same level of detail. But when you're looking at one piece of code that has a certain level of detail, you should be able to understand that in isolation of everything else. So all the other things that are actually sitting out there should be irrelevant. You know, this little piece of code should be self-contained you know, enough that you can understand it on its own terms. Um, and I understand that a lot of code is not written like that, um, but that's where, what I'm aiming for. So there's a, there's a couple of ways uh, where you can, that will help uh, having that sort of design. So first of all, I talked about functional. Uh, I talked about pure functions. So functional programming is one way where you can say, uh, so a pure function is something that only acts on its input, uh, and that means if you if you um, if you don't give it a pure function more input that you know the entire code still fits in your head, then it's going to be completely isolated in um, from everything else that happens in the code base. So that's that's one practical approach to it. If you find FP practical, which some people don't. Um, another, another practical approach to, to trying to get to that sort of design is test driven development, because if you can have a, a thing that you can exercise from a unit test in isolation from its dependencies, then you actually have, you know, you should hopefully have something that is also understandable in isolation from everything else. So that's another, you know, way you can attempt to arrive at a design like this. Um, so wonderful question. Thanks a lot. Let's see if we can get a book up to you here. And I'm I'm sorry that I'm out of books, but that doesn't mean uh, that I don't want to answer any more questions. Uh, but um, can, you, can you pass it up here? I think, think that's going to be a little bit easier this time around. All right, so I'm sorry that you didn't get a book, uh, sir, but um, I'll be happy to take your question. Yeah, let, let me see if I can uh, re rephrase your question so that 
first of all, in order to see if I understood it, and also so everyone else can, can uh, you know, understand what's, what's being asked here. So you say if you have a, a big code base with a lot of complexity, you're probably going to have many layers of abstraction. And um, y your concern is, uh, if I understand you correctly, is that that could, you know, even if we do it in the way that I'm proposing here, where everything is a small self-contained thing, and the, you know, the next level of is an orchestrator, uh, that, that orchestrates and some other things, but that orchestration is self-contained and so on. Um, does that make the code difficult to? Um, does it does it make it difficult to understand the entire structure of the code? How do we how do we navigate a code base like that? Is is that a proper? Well, it's kind of the next step for uh, after you sorted your code, how do you sort your? Oh, so what's the next step? So yeah, so so um, so this this. Um, this way of organizing code is, um, so the idea behind fractal architecture is more to say respect the, uh, respect the cognitive constraints of short-term memory, but that does not as address other questions like questions about architecture. Uh, is, th is that a better way to, to phrase it? Do I, do I have any opinion on should we organize the code in, you know, according to one kind of architecture or another one? Is that, is that a better way of representing your question? Yeah, right, okay. Yeah, so, so the point being made here is that maybe we have different kinds of uh, levels of code, so where the high-level code like, is like business processes that we then de decompose into business, you know, particular business rules, and then maybe we decompose those into how do we actually achieve those, you know, what, what are the, um, what are, what's the, in, what's the I.O. that's going to be so resolved from that and so on. So, so um, if that's not a good paraphrase of your question, then, uh, you know, just hang around and we'll discuss it more, you know, once the talk is over. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, that is that's definitely one way to structure a code base. Now, this idea of, of you know, being, being mindful of the limitations of the human brain and the way that we read and understand things um, is not really a... Um, it doesn't really mean that you can't combine this idea with other things, you know, other kinds of architectures. So you can definitely say, um, you know, if you want to have a specific kinds of architecture, you can... You know, this is this is like a low-level organizing principle. But if you want to have another organizing principle in, on top of that, it, that's definitely possible. So the code base for the book is written. Um, I'm I'm very fond of this kind of architecture called the ports and adapters architecture. Uh, some people know it as the um, hexagonal architecture. Some people know it as, as as the onion architecture or the clean architecture. But it's basically the same idea. Uh, so that's one way you can organize, uh, you know, a code base like that. Even and also keeping keeping this notion of, of you know readability in mind. But there are other ways, you know, other other kinds of application will, will require other kinds of architecture, and you can you can still do this. Uh, this uh, you can follow this notion. So I have like three minutes left. So if you have a short question, um, I'll be happy to take that. On the other hand, no, yeah, okay. So there's one more one there, and that's the last one then. Right. Yeah, great. One, wonderful question. So the question is, when I'm, when I'm trying to do what I've de described here, then how do I handle global shared state? And, uh, and basically we say, well, global shared state is evil. Uh, we also know those as, as global variables, right? Um, so, you know, uh, occasionally something like global sh shared state might be unavoidable. But, um, but, you know, again, if we're thinking about that, that's something we need to know about. If, if we need to know about a, a piece of global shared state, that is, you know, one, one global variable is basically one thing that we always need to keep in mind. So if you have seven of those, you've used up your budget, right? Um, so, uh, so basically what I'm saying here is that if you have all no ops, you, you're allowed to have seven global variables. Uh, but if you actually want to do something, that's going to you know, subtract from your budget of global variables. So don't, don't have global variables. Don't have global shared state. Um, and I understand you know, a database is global shared state. So in the sense, you, you know, most applications will probably have global shared state. Um, but there's a way to think about uh, interactions with something like uh, databases and other pieces of global shared state uh, where you can factor that out so that it doesn't really look like, you know, the, the state does not affect the, um, the actual understanding of the code. So you can imagine that you have a global variable, and um, if you're looking at the code, uh, 
you are never you know, using that global variable. So even though it's, it's you know, technically there, it does not tax your short-term memory because it's not involved. So that's why I call it object activation. There might be objects that are in scope, you know, technically in scope. You could call them if you wanted to, but if you don't, they're not taxing your short-term memory in terms of understanding, and that means they don't count. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, and I think by that I'm also out of time. So thanks a lot for coming, and uh, if you want to hang around, you know, I'll, I'll stick around and answer you know, more, more questions if, if that's interesting. But otherwise, you know, scoot off to the next uh, presentation and have fun. <laughs>